And welcome to this keynote of the section Children and Young Adults Gothic Stuff for our 50 plus Shades of Gothic conference series. We are here with Professor Michael Howard, who kindly agreed to be a guest. And I am going to introduce him very quickly before we start with the interview. So Michael is an associate professor at the Missouri Southern State University. Um, his main teaching areas are creative writing, film studies, American literature to the 1900, British literature of the 19th century, and obviously children and young adults literature. He's also an author of both fiction and critic texts, such as 2014's Under the Bed Creeping, Psychoanalyzing the Gothic in Children's Literature, in which he discusses some of the themes that we are also going to debate today. And then we have Fair Weather Ninjas, a young adult novel published in 2016, and Movies to See Before You Graduate from High School, which is the analysis of 60 movies that he considers essential viewing for teenagers, and that came out in, 2000s, in 2019, sorry. And in 2021, he will be publishing his, his first Gothic novel. And finally, he is a member of the Children's Literature Association and the Southwest Texas Popular Culture and American Culture Association, Sigma Tau Delta, and the National Council for Accreditation of Teacher Education. So first, hello, Howie. Hi, how are you? It's thank nice to be you, here. Thank you again for being here. <clears throat> And I'd like to start with asking something about yourself before we get into the topic. So my first question is, when and in what way has your passion for the Gothic started? And following up to that, um, how do you think that feeding that passion has helped you become the person you are today and also to pursue this particular career? Well, I have a very long relationship with the Gothic. Uh, and it really started with my father. Uh, I didn't realize how how different I was uh, until I started talking with other classmates of mine in elementary school. But my most vivid memory of being terrified and scared uh, in a good way was when I was five years old and my father rented Jaws. And he said, we're going to watch this movie. And we, we sat down and we had popcorn, we had sodas, we turned off the lights and we watched Jaws and it was terrifying and wonderful. And I just, I thought it was awesome and I loved it. Um, and my, my father was very liberal with the, the films that he, he let me see. I was probably the only kid in my kindergarten class who had seen John Carpenter's original Halloween. Um, now, of course, he made me wear a blanket over my head during some of the nude scenes. Um, didn't think I was quite ready for that, but um, that was really my first introduction to, to horror films and to the Gothic. And I, I absolutely loved it. And I can remember in the early 80s when we would go to the video store to rent movies, my favorite section of the video store was always the horror section. and while he was roaming around looking for something to rent us in, in the children's section, something, a Disney movie or something, I was looking at the covers of Friday the 13th and American Gothic and Halloween and um, all of these great movies. And so that's really the, you know, the impetus for what I think started me on this, this creative and critical journey of being interested in the Gothic. And you know, my favorite season has always been autumn. My favorite holiday has always been Halloween. You know, I just get very excited when the leaves start turning and when it stays darker a little longer. You know, I, I'm never happier than when it's thundering and raining outside and the sky is a little gray and, and, and dreary. It's just that that atmosphere is just absolutely wonderful. Um, and I think it's because I just like that duality of good and evil that the gothic portrays so often um, is the negative aspects of humanity that, that to me are very realistic 
and I also like the psychological, um, you know, and the philosophical aspects of, of the Gothic. I think sometimes in realism, trying to present a message can come across as maybe a little didactic or a little preachy, but when you, when you wrap it in a Gothic story, um, it doesn't feel so much like somebody is beating you over the head with a particular message or a way to think. And, and I like that a lot. So when I was a kid, not only did I watch a lot of scary movies, but I also read a lot of horror books. And I can particularly remember reading the Scary Stories anthology by Alvin Schwartz, which was very popular when I was a kid and banned in a lot of places. And if we, we know one thing about being a child or a teenager, it's that if something is banned, you can rest assured that almost everybody will read it uh, because we don't like being told <laughs> what to do. Um, and so that's really reading those books and, and watching those films and just having my imagination constantly whirling in a lot of different ways with a lot of different ideas. I mean, I would picture scenarios in my head and I would, I would write down creative stories. And in middle school, I wrote horror stories all the time um, and turned them in for assignments. And so I just, I really enjoyed that. But basically they, they afforded me a passion, not just for Gothic literature, but for creative writing and for wanting to teach. I, I think it was through the Gothic that I began to understand and appreciate the liberal arts um, and, and really what they can do for you. Um, and this pathway of the Gothic really made me want to discuss and teach the things that I was learning about the Gothic and sharing about the Gothic because I think in a lot of ways it's an under, under valued um, genre that doesn't quite get the respect it deserves, unfortunately. And I, I think that's changing now, but uh, I think there's a lot that the Gothic can offer us if we just allow it to sort of permeate. So do you think and that growing up fully absorbed in these atmospheres and narrations of, of the Gothic, um, has influenced both your research and your fictional production. And since we're talking about it, would you like to tell us more about your upcoming novel? Absolutely. Um, so as I said, I wrote a lot of, I started creative writing really when I was in middle school um, because I was still watching horror films. <laughs> um, and I can remember very clearly that my seventh grade teacher was not a fan of horror. And I wrote, a, I wrote a short story in her class and uh, it was about a, a, a demonic Santa Claus who killed people. He had, he had his little elves who were demons and they slaughtered people. And, um, you know, like instead of garland hanging on the Christmas tree, it was intestines and, you know, just fun stuff like that. And she gave me an F on it. <laughs> because she said she was horrified and so it's, and told me that I needed to write something more upbeat. So I remember the next story I turned in, I made it this, this overly sentimental saccharine story. Um, I don't even remember what it was about, but I remember her talking to my parents and I remember my parents sort of supporting me in my creativity and saying, you know, we don't think there's anything wrong with you. You're just being imaginative. Um, and that was a big moment for me because it, it it told me that this was something that not only could I do, but my parents would have supported me in it as well. Um, and it was really <clears throat> writing children's, sort of writing those Gothic stories and then reading a lot of children's literature that led me to focus specifically on children's literature when I got my PhD. And I took a lot of children's lit classes in my PhD program, but it was, the, it was the Gothic texts I read, like The Secret Garden, that has a lot of Gothic elements to it. Um, and even some of the Harry Potter books um, have some very Gothic scenes in them. That really made me start to wonder how the Gothic can be used as a teaching experience, but also as a way to help children and young adults maybe gain a sense of their own self-identity. And so that was one of the reasons why I wrote Under the Bed Creeping was because I really wanted to explore that connection uh, between literature and the growth and development uh, of young people. And so, because I, I love the idea of being able to talk about issues like class and power and gender um, in ways that don't just 
feel preachy, as I said before, but really start to get under the skin, so to speak. Um, and so I wrote that book and then uh, I wrote my young adult novel, Fairweather Ninjas. But in the back of my head, I'd always wanted to write a story about Elizabeth Bathory, who uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with who she is, uh, but she's a very famous Hungarian countess who is considered one of the most prolific serial killers in the world. She was a real person. She murdered about uh, 600 peasant girls during about a 10 year period and she would, uh, she would bathe in their blood. And that story fascinated me because under the surface, this is really a story about a woman who was afraid of growing old, uh, who was afraid of losing her looks and did everything she could to try to retain her power and her beauty. And I thought that was absolutely fascinating. And so there's been a lot of stories about Elizabeth Bathory, a, a lot of books, a lot of films. And I wanted to approach it from a different angle. I um, mean, I wasn't writing a, a biography. I was writing a book of fiction. But my book uh, tackles the story from the perspective of a, of a young girl who comes to the castle to work as a seamstress. Um, and begins to suspect that things in the castle are not quite what they seem. And then there's a mystery and it unravels from there. So I, I took the main parts of that story, but sort of fictionalized them and made them my own. And that comes out next month. Um, and so I'm very excited about that. So I've been working on sort of promoting that as much as I can. Mm -hmm. But I like working from a critical standpoint and from a creative standpoint at the same time. And I always try to have multiple projects going on <clears throat> just to keep me fresh. Mm -hmm. And so one of the other things I'm doing right now is, is working on a couple of papers um, that deal with the use of the Gothic in children's films, so to speak. So I just wrote a, a paper on uh, Val Luton's Curse of the Cat People uh, from the early 40s and talking about how the gothic in that it acts as sort of a philosophical um, mirror for, for children to present certain issues. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much. And so considering your studies on the topic, obviously, but also your <laughs> personal experience, as we heard, uh, in growing up as a fan of gothic stories, um, how do you think that Gothic literature and more generally Gothic elements in children's literature can help a child in the process of shaping his identity? Well, I always tell my students in class because we often read Gothic texts and I sometimes get students who are a little leery and they say things like, well, is this really for kids? And I always tell them, I use Madeline Langle's famous quotation where she says, how can children appreciate the light if they've never seen the darkness? And I think that's a great quote, because I, I think that if you try to only show them the happy, sunny times, I don't think that prepares them well for when they need to face the darker times. Because as much as we don't want to admit it, our lives are a mixture of good and bad times. Um, there's sadness, there's depression, there's grief, there's death. Uh, it's just unavoidable. If you live on this planet, you're going to have to deal with that at some point. And I think preparing children and young adults for that is is very important and I, I tell my students all the time I say look gothic can help children deal with the problems they're facing because childhood itself is scary it is you know um, you're, you're you're making friends you're losing friends you're being bullied you're living in a world that is controlled by adults a world in which you have <clears throat> no power or control you know when you think about it when you're a child you're basically told when you're going to eat what you're going to eat where you're going to go um, you may even have your clothes bought for you you may get to pick them out but almost everything is done for you and there's very little control there um, gothic literature is all about power and control when, when you think about it um, it's about people trying to assert that control um, and so I think in a lot of ways that helps children. I also like the fact that Gothic, it often externalizes internal fears. And so it takes abstract ideas like grief um, or anger, and it puts them in concrete terms that children can understand. And children at that age 
are also dealing with this understanding of what, what it means to be concrete and abstract. Children know that they experience a certain emotion. They may know when they get mad, but they have a very difficult time verbalizing that and articulating it. Um, the Gothic can help them do that because that's exactly what the Gothic does. I mean, if you look at a book like Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak, and that's a book about dealing with your anger. And it becomes very clear that the wild things symbolize Max's anger, right, towards his mother. And in taming the wild things, he's essentially taming his anger. So it's a great book because it not only helps children to understand what anger means, but also how to deal with that anger and process it in a positive way. So I think those are some of the really interesting things that children can can do with the Gothic. I also like the Gothic because it provides a safe space, meaning it's really important for children to understand some of these themes and issues in a book, to be able to read about them, understand how other characters react to them, understand the actions that the characters make, the consequences that characters face, whether they're good or bad, and learn from that. That way, when they then face those situations in their own lives, they're prepared because they've read about it in a book and they've thought about it and they've talked about it. I know we were just talking about the vaccines before this presentation started, but in some ways you look at literature, those stories are like little vaccinations that you can give to children to prepare them for when they get older and have to deal with these situations, they're adequately prepared for that. Um, and I also think it's a great feeling to be victorious. That's one of the things that about, about Gothic literature a lot of times is that there's a sense of victory you know, at the end. Um, it may not be quite the victory that the person wants, but for children who don't have any power and control, um, seeing another character triumph um, or, or come to a realization or an epiphany, uh, I think is really important in their, in their growth. And I also like that the Gothic seems to me to be very honest with how the world works. You know, it, the world is not unfair. Good does not always triumph over evil. Um, we don't live in a fairy tale, unfortunately. And I think that Gothic literature does a very great job of presenting an honest portrayal, um, at least thematically, of course, uh, in terms of how the real world works. And it forces us to confront what scares us. A lot of times we don't want to admit that we're scared of something. Um, and I think Gothic literature sort of forces us to, to deal with those issues, but in a, in a safe space. And if you get scared, you can close the book and you can come back to it later. Yes, <laughs> very true. <laughs> um, as we already mentioned, um, you teach children's literature at the university. And why do you think it's important to teach Gothic literature? And also why, and what would you say are the most common responses to the Gothic themes from students who attend your classes? And do you find that these responses have evolved during your years of teaching? And finally, um, Sorry, I got, oh, really, I got a bit lost. That's a lot, that's a lot. Okay. So yeah, you did a really good job. Do you think that could be um, a correlation between young people's relationship with the Gothic and great changes in our society? Um, as I said, when I teach Gothic literature in my classrooms, I <clears throat> sometimes students are a little bit leery. And we, we always have to have this conversation about, look, you need to understand the maturity level of the child. Every child is different. I was clearly a little bit weird watching Jaws and Halloween and Aliens when I was still in elementary school and most of my classmates probably weren't. And so you really need to look at it on an individual case by case basis. But I, I also think that children can always handle a lot more than adults give them credit for. And that's something that I, I constantly tell my, my students. But I tell them that it's important to teach Gothic text because at some point in our lives, we're all gonna encounter the big bad wolf um, in whichever form that takes. We all encounter this, this sense of, of danger. Uh, we all encounter threatening scenarios. Um, 
And that's one of the things that I really like about the Gothic. I tell my students, look, Gothic texts can help to illuminate the way we view the world, right? And I, and I think that's important. They help us to learn what frightens us. They help us to learn what fascinates us um, because they, they do fascinate us and that shouldn't be surprising at all. Um, what do most children remember about the fairy tales that they read? <clears throat> Usually it's the scary parts and the, the violent parts and the gory parts. They, they have a penchant for it. Um, they're attracted to it. They're a little bit fascinated by that dark side. Um, and most people are, even people who are afraid of horror films, if you watch them, they may put their hands up over their eyes, but what do they do? They, they peek through because they still mm -hmm. wanna see, right? But also this is a sense of control. I'm controlling what you see, but I still wanna be a part of this because I'm still intrigued. Um, and so when we consider that at some point, as I said, we all encounter the big bad wolf, then these stories, these Gothic texts become a really important mechanism um, for us learning how to conquer our own fears and how to, or how to keep them at bay or how to deal with them and how to communicate with other people. I think it helps us to establish a sense of our own independence and our own self-identities. That's one of the things that makes Gothic such an effective teaching tool for children. That's one of the things we talk about in my classroom a lot is analyzing the text and, and looking at really what they're, what they're trying to say to, to children. Um, you know, if we expect children to live and grow and survive in this world, which is not always fun and it's not always easy, um, we have to provide them with stories that help them to explore their surroundings. Um, and I always tell my students when they're preparing to go into the classroom, I say, if you want children to be engaged in literature, you have to give them something to think about. Um, and Gothic literature always gives you something to think about that because there's so many different conflicts and there's so many different themes um, sort of boiling underneath the surface. And um, it provides an outlet for students. <clears throat> I do think that the Gothic is becoming more established and that's something that I really like. I think that you're seeing um, a shift <clears throat> in how many more children are reading Gothic stories. I think part of that reason is that social media and streaming and the fact that children nowadays are more in tune with what's going on in the world. And they know a lot of the, the darkness and the bad things because they, they see them more and they hear about them more. So they're not quite as sheltered as maybe children in the past have been. And I think that being bombarded with social media and all these images and watching TV and streaming and all that, I think it, it raises questions within them about how the world works and how the world functions and perhaps even how they fit into this world. And so, so I think that a lot of authors are taking advantage of that and, and writing books that are gothic but deal with, with social themes and issues that children are really going to be dealing with. And I think we've already seen this in film. I mean, if you look at Jordan Peele's films, Us and Get Out, those are really dealing with social issues through the, the lens of horror in a very interesting way. And I think the fact that those films do so well shows that there's an interest in this, but he's tackling some issues that people maybe want to talk about, <clears throat> but instead of just coming out and saying, look, we need to talk about race um, or gender, you know, having a discussion through a horror film sometimes makes it a little bit easier to start that conversation. And I, I read a really good book recently called Scar Island, which is a, a gothic children's book, and it deals with bullying, you know, but it presents it in a way that doesn't feel strained. Uh, it presents it in a way that feels very realistic um, because it's done, of course, through the, through the gothic lens. Um, so um, I know you had a lot of questions there, so I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to remember what they all were. Um, but I think overall the responses have been pretty good with my own students. And, and I like the fact that at least when the semester ends, they have a deeper appreciation for the Gothic. Um, and they understand that it can be important. Um, I mean, look, children all the time deal with heightened emotions and a heightened imagination. And I would say that those two things 
are, are very prevalent in the Gothic, heightened emotions and, and heightened imaginations. So when you think about it, it, it makes sense in a lot of ways that children would gravitate to a genre that contains many of the same um, state of emotions and, and level of imagination that children are often using themselves on a daily basis, um, especially in terms of power struggles. Children are constantly in a power struggle, not just with parents, but with their community and with friends. And so they get to see how this plays out in a Gothic text. They get to live vicariously through other characters, you know, and, and test out what happens when they want to act like a character who succeeds. And then when a character who fails and then ask themselves questions about what could this character have done better? And I think a lot of times I've found that <clears throat> when my students read Gothic texts and when children I know read Gothic texts, they tend to have a lot more questions and the, a lot more conversations about those texts. And so I think that just opening up the discussion is, is fantastic, especially today where there's a lot of stuff going on, um, you know, COVID and, and I know that children are reading a lot more <clears throat> because they're, they're at home, yeah. you know, more often they're not going to school. And so reading has become even more important. But I, I think that the Gothic is great because it acts in some ways like a parent, right? When you look at those elements, it, it lets children know that um, struggling with fears and, and then struggling with all these different events, is an, it's an unavoidable part of life. It's something that you're going to have to do, um, but it's an important journey and the lessons they can get from it, I think, can provide them with the strength they need to sort of develop their own self-identity. And it also assures us that, you know, despite the hardships, we can survive, right? And we can grow, we can learn from that as long as we make good choices and learn from our mistakes. So I have one final question. <laughs> Yes. And in the epilogue of your book, Under the Bed Creeping, which we have already mentioned, you say that, and I quote, um, children's literature is for all ages. Can you explain what it means and also why you think it is so important to keep this idea in mind when dealing with children's books? I'm gonna go back again to my class for a second and, and what I tell my students on the first day of class, I always tell them that children's literature is an under-respected, undervalued genre. People think it's easy. And even my students in class, when they tell people they're taking children's literature, a lot of people think oh, that's gonna be an easy class. You're gonna read what? Um, Shel Silverstein, Dr. Seuss, maybe take your tests with crayons. Like, oh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be cake. And I let them know on the first day that this is a serious genre with serious issues, with a very in-depth vocabulary, big themes, and that we're going to take it very seriously. And my students are shocked when they realize just the wealth of value that is in children's literature. Um, you know, I always tell them, you know, people think that children's literature deals with only, the only emotions that children deal with. And I said, but there's really no emotion that is specific to children, right? If you're a human, you have anger, you have depression, you have grief. I, I don't know anybody who's ever said, I can't wait to turn 18 so I can get that new emotion that all my friends have already gotten. It doesn't work like that. So there's, there's, a, there's a line here between children's and adult literature that, that my students think exists and, and it doesn't. And I always tell them that Children's literature can be just as rich, sometimes even more rich than adult literature, because we don't really ever escape our childhood. And I think that's one of the reasons why children's literature is for all ages. We don't just cut it loose when we reach a certain age. Um, our childhood is, is like a shadow that just is always with us throughout our lives. We may not see it. Sometimes it may be bigger than it really is or more pronounced, but it's always there. And the books we read as children, the conversations we have about those texts, um, the use of our imagination helps to shape our identities. And, and we carry that with us into adulthood. So if you stop and think about who you are as an adult and then ask yourself, how did my childhood experiences help to shape that, right? Um, at what point 
did I begin to separate from you know who I was as a child and start to make my own decisions and act more independently? Because that's a big theme in children's literature is this idea of home away home, where the child starts off at home, is supported by parents, is dependent on adults, and then somehow in the middle of the book has to go off on his or her own, make choices on his or her own, whether good or bad, learn from those mistakes, and then come back home at the end of the story changed and, and making those important decisions. And, and if you look at most children's books, they, they contain that very structure of home away home. And so I always tell my students, do not forget that our childhood is always with us and that, you know, Gothic literature and children's literature allows you to have really strong conversations and that the more children read, right, um, the more they'll consider themselves the world around them and, and remember that into adulthood. Because look, ad adults like children's literature, even if they don't want to admit it. You know, um, the Harry Potter books, when they first came out, the covers were very colorful and vibrant and had a lot of pictures in different colors. And as more and more adults began to read the books and maybe didn't want to admit that they were reading children's literature and loving it, you actually saw the publishers change the cover of those books to a very solid color. So from a distance, it looked pretty green or pretty blue and you couldn't tell it was a children's book. So I, I think there's a sense there of, it's not that adults don't like children's literature, sometimes they feel ashamed, like they shouldn't be reading it, that they've moved past that in their lives. Um, and I kind of want to, I want to get my students past that. And I, and I think, I hope I'm doing a good job with that. I try to do it in the classroom, but I also try to do it through, through my critical text as well. Because when I wrote Under the Bed Creeping, and even when I write papers, I try to write them in a way that you don't have to be an academic to understand it, right? I, I don't want to, I don't want to alienate a certain group of people. And I think that parents, teenagers, I would love for them to read a lot of these critical texts that are out there and, and connect with them in some ways and say, I understand how this relates to me. So that, that's something that I think we need to maybe do a little bit more of, you know, is, is try to make some of that ex more accessible to, to the public. Um, because sometimes they say, well, I'm not gonna read that because I didn't understand it or it's too much for me or it doesn't relate to me in any way. But I say, look, if you have kids and you're raising them and they're interested in, in this type of literature or you're looking for literature to use with them to get them thinking about maybe certain issues or ideas that they feel uncomfortable talking about with you, I, I said, you can read some of these critical articles and texts and maybe learn a little bit more about not only what books to use with your kids or students, but how to approach them with some of those issues. Yes, so thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. Well, thank and you, I, I hope think... I answered all your questions. <laughs> yes, yes, you did. So I think we can move on with the Q&A session. So now if everyone has a question for Howie, can raise the hand. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have Monica. Hi, Monica. Um, I can. Anna, can you do it? Uh, I think she. He doesn't have the camera. Uh, we can't hear Monica. She, I think she just typed that in. Uh, the audio is not working, I think, for her. Yeah, she but yeah, she could type out her answer if she wants to put it in the chat. <clears throat> yeah, just type your question. Perfect. I'll just ask mine why she... Hey. Um, Good to see you again, Anna. <laughs> it's me again. 
Um, I was thinking, um, especially uh, listening to um, this last uh, answer you gave, I feel there are some texts that are um, sort of made both for adults and children and maybe the levels uh, an adult can read into them is different than the level uh, children children can read into it. Yeah, um, so and I don't know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Roald Dahl's uh, literature. Um, I'm a big fan of Tim Burton. Yes. <laughs> I'm a big fan of that kind of text that uh, somehow it feels like it is made both for children and for adults giving maybe uh, different messages or I don't know. Uh, there, uh, it, it's a genre I can't quite put my finger on, but I do feel that it's, it's not just for children and it's not just for adults that want to read uh, children's text. Yeah. If you see what I mean. No, I, I totally agree with you. And <clears throat> here's the thing that I think sometimes people forget is when we look at children's gothic texts, these are books that are not written by children. I mean, children are probably, children's literature is, is the only genre not written by its audience. And so when you think about this, you have adults making decisions about how they think a child should act and how they think a child should think. And I think, I'm, I think on one level that's fascinating, but I think about like you mentioned, Roald Dahl and Tim Burton, I think a lot of times, and I, I totally agree with you that there are many different levels that you can look at when you're reading these texts. And I feel like Roald Dahl and Tim Burton, they write for children and they make stories that are accessible to children. But a lot of times their stories are also about how eccentric and strange adults often are in their way of thinking and approaching the world and especially how they approach the idea of childhood. It's almost like they forget that they were innocent once um, and, and are not quite sure how to deal with that theme. Um, and when you were talking, you made me think about another text that I think fits into that, which is The Secret Garden, which is a book that a lot of adults love uh, and can read and relate to because it's also about a parent coping with grief mm -hmm. and dealing with a child who seem sickly and how do you reestablish that relationship with your child um, and then for kids of course it's about making connections with friends and yeah. this sort of um, this this important blossoming relationship with nature pun intended so um, I, I think that's that's equally important um, is often to look at those different levels um, and when I teach children's literature in my classroom we do talk about the fact that there are many, there are always different levels in a book. And, you know, you may, you may not teach Little Red Riding Hood to your students who are in, you know, third or fourth grade and talk to them about sexual awakening um, in that story and how the wolf is the male predator or that, you know, she's a young girl on the verge of womanhood and it's no accident that her hood is red. <laughs> um, but, or that the very last scene is them in bed together, right? But you can talk to them about stranger danger with that story and about not, you know, not having a conversation when a stranger just comes up to them and, and talks to them. So, you know, there are always different levels to these stories. I, I just I just taught the Wizard of Oz uh, a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago in my class, and we we talked about the importance of home. We talked about teamwork like all the, all the themes and issues that children would appreciate. But then on another level, I talked with my students about all the allusions to capitalism that L. Frank Baum puts in The Wizard of Oz about money and how the, the yellow brick road is gold and her shoes are silver um, and how those two metals work together through the book and the Emerald City suggests money and how Baum was a populist, which was a political party at the time. and um, you know, and how the teetotalers were with them, and, you know, um, you know, and that's where the name Toto came from. And we talk about the fact that, uh, you know, 
gold is measured in ounces and the abbreviation for ounces is OZ and how that was one of the things that shaped, you know, the formation of Oz. And so, we, you know, we talk a lot about the differences in reading these texts as a child and as an adult, but also I think it's important to talk about when you read them as a child and then you reread them as an adult. As an adult. There's a there's a huge shift in that. And even my students, they they'll sometimes have read the books we read in class, but when they read them as kids, they read them for fun. And when they read them in my class, which they grumble about, they're forced to analyze the books and to think critically about them and talk about symbolism and we look at themes and all that. And they just say how they they can sort of see through all these layers a lot more than they thought they did and, and look at the word choice and all that. Um, so there are, yeah, there are always many different levels going on here. And I think that sometimes the best writers understand that, whether it's a director mm -hmm. like Tim Burton or a writer like Roald Dahl. Um, and Roald Dahl, of course, is not very, um, he, he's very harsh on adults. <laughs> In his in his stories, um, to a big degree, um, his sympathies lie with you know the children, of course. But a lot of adult, a lot of children's literature, when you think about it, is is not necessarily an adult's view of childhood, but a child's view of adulthood. Mm. Um, and I think that's an interesting perspective to look at. Alice in Wonderland is one of those that stri always strikes me as that's not really an adult's view of childhood, but it's a child's view of mm -hmm. adulthood because all the adult characters in that book are crazy. The Mad Hatter, the Queen of Hearts, the Cheshire Cat, like Al Alice walks around looking at all these adults thinking, I don't understand you. You make no sense to me. You're crazy. You're weird. And a lot of times that's how, <laughs> that's how kids view adults. They don't always understand why we do the things we do. Um, and so I think, I think those two examples, Roald Dahl and Tim Burton, certainly certainly do that with, with their characters, you know, and their themes as well. And I think that sometimes gives kids um, support in a way and saying, look, you're probably not the only one who thinks like this. Bit of a triumph. Yeah, and it, it invites them into a community where they know that there are other, there are other characters who think exactly like them <laughs> and aren't the only one who thinks, wow, all the adults around me are absolutely crazy. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And as you were uh, talking now, I do have another question that Absolutely. might be naive, but uh, as we all know, how the original version of many a fairy tale uh, is, why do you think it was changed? Why do you think they were made uh, less gory and less horrific and less gothic? at a certain point, just to tell children a um, bit of a, I don't know, a whitewashed version of, of yeah. original fairy tales. Why, why was that done, you think? They wanted to keep children innocent and, and they were afraid that reading about, you know, Cinderella's sister chopping off parts of their feet um, or, you know, the wicked queen in Snow White wanting to eat her lungs and, you know, liver. Um, I think they thought that, that that would terrify children too much. And so, you know, as fairy tales became more widely read to children um, and read by children, I, I, I think they decided to change that because, you know, they, they didn't want to terrify children and maybe warp their growth and development. Um, and I think that was a mistake. I mean, my, my students are shocked when I have them read the Grimm's versions of these stories. And they're like, I was raised on Disney. Yeah. Um, and I say, well, Disney doesn't really allow the characters to make a lot of choices on their own. They're, all the choices are made for them. So if you don't make a choice on your own, there's really no opportunity for growth and development, right? You have to make a bad choice or a good choice, live with the consequences yeah. and process that. You know, the Grimm's do that. Um, and I think children are smart enough to know that it's, Look, they know it's a story, right? And, and they know that, but they they do like those dark aspects. I think that's one of the reasons why you're seeing those stories, the original versions, being read more and more now mm -hmm. to kids. But I think when they were changed, it was because they they didn't think children could handle it, and they thought that it would, you know, 
sour their innocence. Yeah. And Shock them. We didn't want to do that. Yeah. They, you know, children are too precious and fragile, right? They can't handle this. And, and so they ended up changing those stories. Yeah. If you look at the 1812 original version of the Grimm's nursery and household tales, and then look at it even, I think it's the 1818 version, they're, they're already starting to make changes with a lot of those stories. I think in the original version of Rapunzel, Rapunzel says something to her, uh, the witch, like, I don't understand why my clothes don't fit me anymore because she's pregnant. And that's how the witch finds, that's how the witch finds out that the prince has been sneaking into the tower um, to visit with her. But by the time the second edition came out, people were like, well, we can't have any allusion to this sex if children are reading this. So they changed it to, I think she says something like, you're so much harder to pull up on my hair than the prince is. And the witch was like, oh, I guess you're seeing the prince. So, <laughs> um, you know, it just makes a, it makes a big difference, I, I think, in the stories. And I think it also sort of shows a lack of respect for children's understanding and what they can handle. Um, and it, ta it takes away from the, from the original story. Yeah, and you know, I think it's kind of funny that uh, this kind of preoccupation was uh, so, you know, shared and we, we have to not scare children and we have to protect them from this kind of stuff. And then sometimes, you know, I, I didn't grow up like this, but I hear stories uh, or my mom, uh, or even people my age, actually, as I, I don't know a lot of Mexicans, for example, and they were told the stories by their own parents, you know, like the monster living under your bed or <laughs> the devil and stuff like that, that are far more scary than reading oh, yeah. a fairy tale because you think that that's really going to happen to you that's a real life and the, the devil is going to come for you yeah and you can be terrified of that <laughs> as a kid my my mother whenever i misbehaved as a child she would pick up the phone and threaten to call the mean man <laughs> And she told me that he was this guy who drove around the neighborhood and he picked up kids who misbehaved and brought them to his house and they lived in his house and ate, you know, ate bread and drank water and there was no TV or anything like that. And, you know, and I was like, wow. <laughs> Look, I mean, if I misbehaved, my mom would be like, pick up the phone and I would be like, all right, all right. <laughs> fine I'm done I don't want to go I don't want to go live with the mean man um and I think she's a little embarrassed now when I bring it up sometimes <laughs> like, well you know I got to use my imagination a little I was like what does this guy's house look like you know it's uh dirty and you know, our children shackled together in the in the house and but you know that was that was scary for me so yeah I didn't my parents didn't do it but uh when I was a kid there was still uh in my town there was still this thing that they would tell you that the gypsies mm. would steal you if you yeah. misbehaved or and I mean that's so so twisted I mean you're just giving me so much bad information with that yeah. with that uh threat you know yeah. and I don't know <laughs> it's just silly that then you cannot tell me Rapunzel's story yeah but, you know, parents telling their kids stories like that is just an extension of the way that Gothic was originally treated hundreds of years ago, where um, when it was used, it was used as a deterrent to bad behavior. I mean, if you look at Carlo Collati's Pinocchio, which is very different from the Disney version, I mean, that is, he is stabbed, hanged beaten, caught in a steel trap, uh, almost cooked and eaten alive twice. I mean, it's dark, but he goes through hell. And, you know, the Gothic elements in that book are really used to deter children, scare them into behaving. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of times the, the Gothic has been used to do exactly that, scare children into behaving. Um, and the negatives of that, of course, is that it doesn't really necessarily allow you to have a conversation because you're so scared you don't want to talk about it. So there has to be this 
in safe space. And I think we're seeing a lot more of that now where it's not used as necessarily a punishment. Um, it's used as a- as Yeah, a you know, we were just actively, we were just talking uh, about this with uh, Jeffrey Weinstock and he commented that he finds that, for example, in um, animated movies for children, yeah. the scary ones, um, in the last few years, he thinks that there's been a change in who the monster is. Yeah. So they're getting about diversity and about the monsters are usually the adults that don't understand the little monster yeah. or the people that are, are evil and not the little monster that the kids yeah. hang out with, you know, and that's very interesting. And that's cool because that means the Gothic, whether it's literature or film, is really starting to approach issues of diversity you know, a little bit more than it had in the past, right? Yeah. Of, you know, that not all monsters are bad. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, if you you know Neil Gaiman's The Graveyard Book is a, is a book that I absolutely love, but when you read that book, the characters that are normally associated as being evil are the good characters and the characters you would normally associate as being good are bad. Yeah. And so he completely flips it around on its head and that, and that allows you to have a conversation about not just diversity, but how we label people and how we have certain expectations. Mm -hmm. So, which is something children can definitely relate to labels and expectations. And, you know, as they go yeah. through elementary school and middle school and get involved with cliques and who am I? I'm, an, I'm still an extension of my parent, but I'm trying to be my own person. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I will leave you to... Um, Did Monica have her question Monica? still? Or is she? Yes. Uh, should I read it? Should I read it? Yes. Monica says, first of all, sorry for the inconvenience and thank you, Michael, for your inspiring talk. My laptop ran out of battery and I'm stuck with the office's computer. <laughs> no problem, Monica. I wanted to ask you to what extent you engage with psychoanalysis in your classes. I know psychoanalysis is a big part of the study of Gothic literature and you yourself have been talking about unknown fears and similar emotions. But as far as I know, child psychologists are not very fond of psychoanalysis. How do you deal with this sort of contradiction, especially in the study of Gothic or horror children's literature? All right, well, thank you for the question, Monica. Um, I'll start within my class. In, in my classes, I, I teach a wide range of literature, so I don't just teach the Gothic texts. And at my university, all the students who are in the teacher education program studying to be teachers have to take a class on child psychology separately anyway. So I've been very lucky that by the time they usually come to me, they've, they've studied that and they're, they're a little bit more understanding and able to grasp some of the material that we read in the class. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a hard line to, to straddle here, this idea of do we really wanna psychoanalyze children and how do we wanna look at that? You know, I look at it as, when I, when I teach a, a book, and I'm just gonna use Gothic as an example, since that's what we've been talking about, I focus on the choices and the decisions a lot of times that the characters make and how they change as a result of those decisions. So I guess what I try to do is, is I try to make it universal and I try to keep it universal, um, where I say, look, one of the great things about literature and, and really, written characters is that regardless of what country they're from or what race they're from or, or background a really well-written character that you relate to shares some of your own passions and desires and interests and fears um, and so instead of really maybe getting into the psychoanalyzing aspect of that I try to find ways that we can connect to the characters um, and ask questions about how are we like those characters and how are we different from those characters uh, and an exercise that I often have my students do is I will, I will often make them write a paragraph about how they're like a character and then a paragraph about how they're not like a character. Um, and then 
I'll also ask them to write about maybe write about a good decision that character made in the book and a bad decision that character made in the book. So in a lot of ways, you're getting at some psychological questions without really digging down into the psychoanalyzing aspect that has to go along with that a lot. Because when you talk about those choices, you have a conversation about, was that a good choice? Was that a bad choice? What were the consequences or the repercussions that came about as a result of that choice? Um, and every time we do that, we talk about, look, what can children gain from this text? Because my first question with my students all the time is, when you choose a piece of literature to teach in your class, and, and this is even true for me as a college professor, is the first question you want to ask is, what do I want my students to gain from this text? Like, why am I, why am I teaching it? Um, you know, it can't just be that, well, in 10th grade, they're supposed to read this, so this is what they're all going to read. That's not, that's not a good answer, and they're not going to enjoy it if you don't provide a roadmap for them to follow. And so I always start by saying, look, this is what I want you to get out of the text. I want you to understand these concepts. Let's talk about some different themes. And I think sometimes a different thing about psychoanalyzing is every single person is going to have a different response to that book because we're all different people. We've all had different life experiences. We've all made different choices. We've all um, succeeded. We've all failed. And so whenever you read a text, you're going you're gonna to gravitate towards certain characters or certain parts of that text that somebody else won't. And because of that, that's what allows us to have really inspiring, interesting conversations in the classroom. Because I think we all know that in order to really understand and appreciate a book, you usually need to read it a couple of times um, and get through those layers. We don't have that luxury in a college classroom of reading a book multiple times. But the closest we can come to that is having 10 different students read the same book and having 10 different interpretations of that book and then talking about it. And so I think sometimes when you psychoanalyze, you run the risk of trying to say, it's like this and it's one thing, or it's like this and it's another thing and it's not. And so I like the fact that we can have these conversations with all these different students about different themes because I think it lends a lot of different interpretations. Um, and I think sometimes you lose that when you try to focus on psychoanalysis a little bit. I hope that answers your question. Okay, and we also have Riley. Disappear now. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, how are you? Hi, so uh, hi Howie, hi everybody else. Uh, fascinating presentation, really terrific. You have touched upon some aspects of the Gothic that were very interesting and uh, congrats on your last uh, latest novel. Thank you. My question will be very brief and simple. If you could give two or three recommendations, whether a book or a movie, to somebody willing to approach these themes or like the Gothic in general for the first time, what would your topics be? Books and films? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, I, I definitely would recommend The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. Um, I, think that's, I think that's a great book. And for students especially who have grown up watching The Jungle Book, the Disney film, and I know there's many versions, they'll be even more familiar with some of the key themes and ideas uh, in that text. There's also a really good Gothic novel called Peppermints in the Parlor uh, that is not very well known, but it's, it's, it's very Gothic. And I would, I would recommend that as a book. Um, I would recommend the book I just read called Scar Island, which is for middle grades. So it's not quite for children. Uh, I would say for maybe students in middle school and up. Um, in terms of films, I like Paranorman. I think Paranorman is a really good film, but getting students to sort of understand a little bit more of the idea of death and how we process that uh, and loneliness. So it shows some of those good themes. Um, I like Frankenweenie by Tim Burton. I think that's a, that's a, that's a fun, I like the, the short, but I also thought the movie was really good. I like that a lot too. Um, and since I just was writing about it, I think that Val Luton's Curse of the Cat People from the early 40s is a really good film. It's not really a horror film, 
uh, it, it's more gentle than a lot of the, the horror films that came out during that time, but it really deals with childhood trauma um, in a way that's a little bit eerie, but also very touching. So those would be my those would be my picks. But if you email me, if I think of more, I'd be happy to email you some uh, some recommendations as I kind of mill through this a little bit more. Thank you, thank you, very nice. Actually, the recommendations are for me, but as you wildly explained to us, children literature is for adults, so <laughs> I'll be glad to follow up on that. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Sorry, <laughs> um, okay. Good job with the questions. I, okay, <laughs> I couldn't take Oli off the screen, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, I think we're done. And so we, we stopped the recording, but don't leave. We have something to tell you. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, everyone can <laughs> turn your camera on and we say bye to Howie. All together. And thank you all for showing up and uh, I appreciate it. It was wonderful to speak with you today and uh, talk a little bit about my, my loves and passions for the Gothic and children's literature and all that. It's always nice to be with a group of people who share similar interests and, and you know. Okay, thank you again and see you.